kamay Bakit bayani sa harap ng pagsuko Huwag kang susuko Bigyan ang boses ang sigaw ng masa Ang bagong pag-asa ay Mula si Oo, mula si Oo, mula si Oo Panibagong pag-asa ay mula si Oo Hi, NSD students. I'm so happy to be sharing with you the basics of drug education. I am Professor Francis Grace H. Duca Pante from the UP College of Education, Health Education Area, and I'm also serving as a director of the ASEAN Training Center for Preventive Drug Education. For today, I'm going to share with you the basics or the essentials of drug education. But before we do that, I would like to do a feelings check. So as you can see from this slide, I have the animal moods. So A stands for sadness, okay, B is for happiness, and C is for being grumpy. And I know that many of you can relate with these emotions. And well, the point of this slide is to make you realize that whatever you are feeling right now, we are in the midst of a pandemic, whatever you are feeling is exactly normal and valid. So I guess we're now ready to start. So we are going to cover four subtopics for this presentation. We're going to start with drug-related terms and concepts. Next, we're going to move on to the effects of drug use, then the legal aspect of drug use, and lastly, which is the most important part of the presentation, is the skills for a drug-free lifestyle. So the objectives of this presentation include to discuss basic terms and concepts related to drug use. The second is to describe the general effects of drug use and its legal implications. And the third is to recommend ways to develop life skills for a healthy and drug-free life. So first, we're going to review some important concepts. Let us differentiate drug from medicine. So a drug is any chemical agent that alters the biochemical or physiological processes of tissues of organisms. So it means that when you ingest drugs, okay, it alters the function or the structure or of any part of your body. If it's a psychoactive substance, it alters the function and structure of your brain. While medicine is actually a kind of drug with curative properties, so you need to remember that medicines are drugs, but not all drugs are medicines. So I hope you understand that clearly. So now let's proceed to the difference between medicine misuse and abuse. So when we say misuse, this is the use of a medicine for a purpose that is not consistent with medical guidelines. So you don't follow the doctor's prescription. So for instance, when you take too much of a medicine, when you take it for reasons other than the reason they were prescribed for, or when you stop a medication, or you accept a prescription medication from a friend, those are examples of medicine misuse. While for medicine abuse, you are using a particular medicine to feel high or because you'd like to experience that euphoric feeling. So you take those medicines, okay, because there is a compulsion for you to use it despite negative consequences. So when you do that, you're experiencing medical or medicine abuse. Now I'm going to introduce to you a general term and it's called substance use. It's actually the use of psychoactive substances that includes tobacco, alcohol, of course the illegal drugs of abuse like marijuana and shabu, inhalants, and other non-medical use of prescription medication. So you need to remember that in the global context now, substance use is the term being used to describe the use of tobacco, alcohol, illegal drugs of abuse, inhalants, and other non-medical use of prescription medications. What is substance use disorder? Well, this is a chronic relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive substance seeking and use despite harmful consequences. So now instead of using the term drug abuse or substance abuse, we use the term substance use disorder. Well, we will now proceed to an activity called knowledge check. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to get a piece of paper and then write your answers to these statements, whether they are true or false. So you just need to write T for true and F for false. So number one is all drugs are bad. Is this a true or a false statement? 
Second, legal drugs are generally safe. Third, drug users are not morally weak. And lastly, majority of people are non-users. Okay, so I'm going to give you 10 seconds to write your answers. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time is up. Okay, so now let's check your answers. Is the first statement a true or a false statement? All drugs are bad. This is actually a false statement you are correct because we said that medicines are actually drugs with curative properties so this is a false statement the second one legal drugs are generally safe this is another false statement because we all know that tobacco and alcohol are legal drugs but they have dangerous effects on the body so they are unsafe for use number three Drug users are not morally weak. Is this a true or a false statement? This is a true statement, okay? They are not morally weak. We need to remember that behavior is a very complex thing. And explaining drug use is actually complicated because it is multifactorial. So we are going to talk about that later on. And then the last one, majority of people are non-users. This is definitely a true statement. So congratulations if you're able to get all four items correctly. So again, one and two are both false statements. Three and four are true statements. So give yourself a pat on the back if you were able to get four out of four. Now I'm going to share with you a model, and it's called the Risk and Protective Factors for Substance Use or Drug Use. And this is going to be quite surprising for many of you. Because when I've learned about this, I was surprised myself. Yeah, the first one is that, by the way, be, before I start with these factors, I would like to uh, make you realize that risk factors are factors that increase your susceptibility or vulnerability to drug use. So the number, uh, the, the first one is genetic predisposition. So it's really a surprise that about 40 to 60 percent of substance vulnerability to substance use is actually genetic, genetically uh, determined. So there is a genetic predisposition. The second one is that there are certain personality traits that increase our vulnerability. So this include risk taking, sensation seeking, and impulsive behavior. And the last one is that when you have overall health conditions, okay. So if you have coexisting health issues, like if you have mental health issues, then that predispose you to risk um, to substance use and other unhealthy behaviors. So in general, these are the risk factors, but if we're going to look at risk factors in the school setting, it includes school failure. So if you are academically um, having problems, okay, if you have low commitment to school, so you have very low motivation, especially now that we're going to do remote learning. So if you have difficulty uh, uh, committing to schoolwork, then that is actually a risk factor. So for those who are social isolates or those who are being rejected, there's rejection by peers, there's association with deviant and substance using peers, in general, these are risk factors, okay, in the school setting. Now let's move on to the protective factors. These are the factors that decrease your susceptibility or vulnerability to substance use. So the first one is very important. If you have self-control, okay, if you have this behavior, behavior regulation, and you're academically competent. So I guess because you're in UP, you have this protective factor, so congratulations. And then if you have a school-based drug education in UP, it's uh, we have actually courses that deals with drug education. So for instance, in the College of Education, you have EDH130, okay, for undergraduate students. It's consumer health education and drug education. We also have that in the graduate level. It's called uh, EDH209, Drug Education. So, And I'm so happy that the NSTP is integrating this in the curriculum. Okay, because it's really very important for us to know the skills, the competencies that we need so that we'll be able to live a healthy and a drug-free lifestyle. Another protective factor is strong neighborhood attachments. 
and of course parental influence okay if your parents are loving you have a very supportive home environment that's a very good protecting factor. And then if you have a rich environment and at home and school, there is enforcement of limits and discipline, okay, with you. They monitor, okay, the adults monitor your activities. That is an important protecting factor. Let's look at the global context of substance use or drug use. So currently, this is actually the latest data from the U.S. United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. This is the World Drug Report uh, 2020, okay? They just released this last June 26. And it says that in 2018, there were actually 269 million drug users. And this is 5.3% of the global population. I'd like you to remember that, 5.3%. Why? Because I'd like to emphasize that majority of people are non-users. Majority of young people like you are non-users. Why is this important? Because there is a notion that among young people that they tend to smoke or drink alcohol or worse, use illegal drugs because they have this misconception that most or majority are using substances when in fact it's not true okay so remember that majority are non-users so according to the dsm-5 this is the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders fifth edition okay this was actually uh, published by the american psychiatric association we no longer use the term drug addiction or dependence but rather it refers to problematic use of drugs as substance use disorder or as a substance-induced disorder. So again, let me remind you that we are no longer using the term drug addiction. So please do not refer to a person who is using drugs or substances as a drug addict because that is actually demoralizing, okay? It's, it's um, stigmatizing. So instead, we refer to a person with a problematic use of drugs as a person with substance use disorder. So how do we know, okay? You also need to remember that the term being used is substance use and not substance abuse. So substance use is a neutral term because we need to look at substance use as a continuum, so from mild to severe. And so according to the DSM-5, there are 11 criteria, okay, that we need to watch out for so that we will be able to assess whether the person has mild, moderate, or severe case. So how do we know? So let's look at the 11 criteria for substance use disorder. Number one is hazardous use. The second is social or interpersonal problems related to you. So meaning you have problems dealing with maybe your friends, your family members, and you are now neglecting your major role. So you, you can no longer study if you're working. You tend to... Dip, um, to actually do things other than working. So you, you actually experience withdrawal. So withdrawal are the unpleasant symptoms that you feel whenever you stop using the drug or the, or the psychoactive substance. You also experience tolerance. Tolerance is the need to increase the dosage of the drug so that you will be able to experience the same effect, okay? Number six is used larger amounts for a longer duration. Seven, repeated attempts to quit or control use, and then there is much time spent using. The, the, the person experiences physical or psychological problems related to use, and there are activities being given up to use the substance. And lastly, there is craving. So based on this 11 criteria, if the person exhibits two to three, then that person is considered a person with mild substance use disorder. If you have four to five criteria, then you are a moderate case. Six or more, then you are a severe case that necessitates treatment and rehab, uh, rehabilitation. So now let's proceed to the general health consequences of substance use. So, well, this can be categorized into two. So we have the short term and the long term. So in general, when you take substances, especially illegal drugs, then it depends actually if it's a stimulant, 
a depressant or a psychedelic. But generally, in the short term, you will experience changes in appetite, wakefulness or drowsiness. There is also a change in respiratory and heart rate. So if you took a stimulant, for example, then it will increase your respiration and your heart rate. There would be change in mood. So if you, for instance, to a stimulant, then you will be energetic, you will be happy, okay? And then if it's a depressant, there will be a slowed reaction time or reflexes, which there would be nausea and vomiting. And for psychedelics, people may experience hallucination, okay? Or, uh, and then for um, depressants, they will experience decreased motor coordination. So in the long term, Many of these psychoactive substances can produce adverse effects, okay? So negative consequences on our uh, health. So this includes having heart or lung disease, cancer, different kinds of cancer, mental issues, HIV and AIDS, especially for those who inject psychoactive substances, hepatitis, okay? And then there, there could be physical or psychological dependence, memory loss or brain damage and malnutrition. So generally in the long term, the use of psychoactive substances can lead to substance use disorder. So it depends on a lot of factors, but you need to remember that factors can include the type of substance being used, the duration and the frequency of use. Again, in general, let's look at the cost of substance use. So for the person using the psychoactive substance, um, he or she can be predisposed to accidents, to different diseases, then mental issues, depression, and the worst is death. For interpersonal, for the interpersonal aspect, okay, so relationships can be damaged, there can be marital conflict for, for couples, okay, for married people, there can be disruption in friendships, and possible child abuse, so if the parents are using substances, there is a high probability that there would be violent behavior. Okay, for social functioning, this includes dangerous behavior. Okay, especially for those who are, who are actually um, using psychoactive substances and then they can commit crimes. Okay, there might be financial problem, employment difficulty, and legal problems. So now at this point, I'd like you to do an alert, alertness check. So very easy. You just need to follow the instruction as shown in the slide. You just need to grab your left ear with your right hand. Okay, left ear with your right hand. And now grab your nose with your left hand. Then you reverse. Okay, so now it's time to grab your right ear with your left hand. And now grab your nose with your right hand. So you can do this alternately. I just would like to be sure that you are still with me. So very quickly, let us just review. Why are adolescents like you more vulnerable to risky behavior? Why are you uh, have higher susceptibility to risky behavior such as drug use? Well, basically because your brain is still developing. So you need to remember that the brain development starts from the back towards the front. And the back part, okay, this, um, this is actually in charge of emotional regulation. Okay, and the prefrontal cortex is in charge of reasoning, organizing, prioritizing information, control of impulses, decision making, and judgment. And this is not fully mature until age 25. This is the reason why usually you make decisions um, because of your emotions. Okay, so the main responsibility of adults like us okay is to guide you in making right choices in life so what are the highest risk periods among young people like you so you need to remember that during major transitions you are particularly vulnerable so this includes the transition from elementary to high school junior to senior high school and of course from senior high school to college or work so this particular transitions in your life are make make you particularly vulnerable to risk-taking behaviors so better watch out when you are transitioning 
Now we will proceed to the legal implications of drug use. So we have a law, okay? This is the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002. This is Republic Act 9165. When you watch the news and there is uh, news about a uh, drug-related incident, you always hear this law being cited. So RA 9165. So basically, we're just going to look at a very important provision in that law, and that is Section 15, the use of dangerous drugs. So according to the law, first offense, the penalty is minimum of six month rehabilitation in a government sector. Okay? So, and then if it's a second offense, there would be six years and one day to 12 year imprisonment and a fine of 50,000 to 200,000 pesos. So you need to remember the legal implication of using dangerous drugs. So dangerous drugs pertain to illegal drugs, such as the use of marijuana and shabu. Lastly, we are now going to proceed to the most important part of this presentation. This is the skills for a substance free life. So, how are we going to safeguard our health and well being and ensure that we are living a drug free life? There are three very important skills that we need to enhance, especially among young people like you. So, the first one is assertiveness. The second is decision-making skill. Remember, your prefrontal cortex is still developing. So we need to really enhance your decision-making skills. And the last very important life skill is, is on resistance or refusal skills. So how to say no, how to refuse an offer of a psychoactive substance. So let's start off with the assertiveness skill. So I have here, the OFNR script. So this is an acronym that stands for observation, feelings, need, and request. So as you can see from this slide, there are several steps to assertive action. The first one is to state your observation. So um, the script here is that, of course, you need to describe the situation. Okay, so for instance, you can tell a friend when you offer when, when you offered me a stick of cigarette, tell the person how it made you feel without blame. I was actually disappointed because I thought that you were my friend, right? And then after that, you express your need. So in that situation, I need to, um, I need to know that you value my health. And lastly, you need to state your request. So please, offer a healthy alternative so that's it and this is very much applicable to different areas of our life so whenever you are faced with a situation that compromises your health you can make use of the OFN or script so this is an, the steps to assertive action and the script that you can use to be assertive okay because actually many of Many of us, okay, many, many Filipinos have difficulty being assertive. So it's very easy for us to be passive, okay? We just don't do anything. Or the opposite is that uh, we become aggressive. So the middle ground is really to be assertive. When you are assertive, you respect the right of the other person, and at the same time, you respect yourself. And now let's proceed to the decision-making skill. And I'm going to make use of the DECIDE model. Again, just like the OFNR acronym, we have an acronym. Now it's the DECIDE model. So the acronym here is DECIDE. So it's very easy to remember, okay? So the DECIDE here stands for D is to determine the problem or the issue. So what is the issue at hand? Is it, um, am, am I going to drink alcohol or not? And then you explore the alternatives. There you have two options, right? And then letter C is to consider the consequences. If you drink alcohol, what's going to happen? If you don't drink, what's going to happen? And then I is to identify your values. What is the most important thing for you? Is it to satisfy your need for belongingness for your friends is it 
uh, the va your value about health and wellness. Okay, you value your your parents' advice. What is it that is most important to you? And then after weighing all of these things and identifying your values, now it's time to decide. And don't forget the last step. This is very important. You need to evaluate your decision. Were you able to come up with the right decision? If not, then there is a great lesson learned, right? So the basic rule really is to stay away from situations where you can be tempted. So stay away from situations. So for instance, if it's very hard for you to say no, okay, um, don't go to parties, okay? Don't go to social activities or in, you know that there will be alcohol. So stay away from situations where you can be tempted. This is the general rule for the refusal or the resistance skills. There are also other strategies that you can use, okay, to say no. These are strategies that you can try, okay? So maybe you can try this out with a partner. Maybe you're a sitmate right now. You can choose any of the strategies to use. So imagine that one of you is offering a bottle of alcohol to another and the other person, your partner, needs to say no. So which of the following are you going to use? The first one is very simple. You just need to maintain eye contact, eye contact, and say no fearly. So eye contact, and just say no. Okay? The second one is you can match your verbal with nonverbal signals in refusing the offer. So when you say no, you do this. You don't do this. Okay? So your, your verbal and nonverbal signals should be consistent. Okay? Remember that action speaks louder than words. So better it, it should be consistent. And then you can use the broken record technique. So this one is you say no as many times as needed. So when the other person keeps on offering, okay, this is just one state, no. Okay, don't worry, this is going to be free, no. Oh, I'm not going to tell your parents, no. So you say no as many times as needed. That's the broken record technique. And then you can also use the cold shoulder approach. Or... Can give reasons or excuses it's um i don't like to smoke because i have a lung problem so make up excuses and then give helpful alternatives so instead of drinking alcohol why not drink water water is still the healthiest drink right so this is the last part so helpful alternatives many young people say that they smoke they drink alcohol, or worse, they use illegal drugs because for them, it's a lifestyle. And so we need to offer healthful alternatives to drug use. So what can you do? There are actually a lot of things that you can do instead of engaging in substance use. So I have here several recommendations. These are just examples. You can do spiritual activities. You can do something that will nourish your minds. You can do volunteer work. You can join organizations. Maybe they're available online, okay? Because now we are in a new normal. So volunteer work. And then I have here Barcada Contra Droga. This is actually a peer-based approach to substance use prevention. This is a program of the Dangerous Drugs Board and the Department of Education. Um to encourage young people to form clubs and develop their life skills together so that they will be able to live a healthy and drug-free lives. By the way, the UP College of Education, uh, through the health education area, made this infographic last April. Okay, so we came up with an alphabet guide. So these are the many things that you can do to stay sane while we are in the midst of the pandemic. So feel free to have a copy of this. You can get this from the UP College of Education website. 
The Ashan Training Center for Preventive Drug Education based in the College of Education also produced this infographic, Healthy Lifestyle for the New Normal, and it says, Be Healthy, Be Drug Free. So again, I, we have here an acronym that stands for the different activities that you can do in order to have a healthy lifestyle for the new normal. So let me end by saying there are so many things that you can engage. Please be active. Remember that exercise is the best antidepressant. It's free. And it's very practical. Give because it makes you happy. You connect to people. So not social distancing, but physical distancing. Be connected to the people you love, to the people who matter to you. Yeah, connect virtually and then keep learning and take notice. So be observant. So stay drug-free amid COVID-19 crisis. This is the last activity that I'd like you to do. This is the Commitment Act, and I'd like you to stand with the left hand outstretched, palm up, okay? So left hand outstretched, palm up, okay? And then you're going to swing your right arm in a circle, and then you are going to put it on your outreach hand and say, I commit to living a healthy and substance-free life. And you're going to repeat for three times, okay? So I'm assuming that you are doing it right now. So stand with the left hand outstretched, palm up, swing your right arm in a circle, okay? And then put it here and then say, I commit to living a healthy and substance-free life. Okay. Can we do this together? We're going to repeat this for three times. One, two, three, go. I commit to living a healthy and substance-free life. I commit to living a, sub a healthy and substance-free life. I commit to living a healthy and substance-free life. Thank you so much for your commitment. I have here a homework for you, and this is make an abstinence box. So what is an abstinence box? So this is simply a box that contains five items that you most value and that would help you stay drug free. So let me give you an example. I have here my abstinence box and let me share with you the contents of my abstinence box. So these are my these are the items. I have here a picture of my students. They inspire me to be my best. I have here a rosary, okay, because I'm a Catholic. And then I have here an item from Kenya because I'd like to, I love to travel and I hope to travel after this pandemic. You learn a lot from traveling. And then of course I have here a pen because I love to write. And the quotations. I have your reputation. It is never too late to be what you might have been by George Eliot. So these are the five items in my abstinence box. And I'm challenging you to come up with your own abstinence box. box put the five items that would help you stay healthy and drug free. So thank you so much, everyone. At this point, I'd like you to share your insights by writing it down so you can answer these questions. I, I made use of the model, what, so what, now what? So what is your most important learning from this webinar or this e-lecture? So what did this webinar or e-lecture make you realize? Now, what do you plan to do to be healthy and substance-free? Remember, Confucius said, Knowledge is nothing without application. So thank you so much, everyone. Let me end by saying, teaching nourishes my mind, strengthens my heart, and nurtures my spirit. I don't do it for a living. It is my life. Thank you. Bagong pag-asa ang